Well, good morning, New Mammoth family. Please go ahead and open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 21 together this morning. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, let us know. We would love to gift you one. Um, But also, there is a free ESV Bible in our uh, NMBC app, which you can uh, download on our website or on the App Store, as well as um, there will also be the, the, the sermon, the, I can't talk this morning, that's not good. Uh, the verses will be up on the slides, on the screens. Okay, well would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word? John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. On the evening of that day, The first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am. I'm sending you. Please be seated. Today, we are beginning a new sermon series entitled Breakdown, The God Who Is There When We Fall Apart. You know, it's difficult to deny that there is a present heaviness in our world today, grief, Anxiety, unrest, depression, and uncertainty are all on the rise in our current cultural landscape. Statistics show that in the last year, 20% of adults in the U.S. suffer from mental illness, 5% of which are severe cases. 25% of Americans have issues with anxiety, 8% have a substance abuse disorder, and 11 million adults in the United States have had serious suicidal thoughts over the past year. And so as the people of God, these statistics and this present heaviness that we are confronted with, it it, it forces us to ask the question, well, where is God in all of this? Well, we read in Ecclesiastes 1.9, there is truly nothing new under the sun. That throughout history, People, nations, and cultures have experienced such difficult seasons, far worse than the difficult season that we find ourselves in the midst of. And what we come to find is that time and again, our Heavenly Father meets our grief with His goodness. He comforts our sadness with His steadfast faithfulness and assures us in our uncertainty like only He can. And so over the next two months, as a church family, we're going to look at specific passages in both the Old and New Testaments that display how throughout redemptive history, our God never leaves or forsakes us, but rather he is always there for us when we need him most. The times when it seems and feels like everything in our world is breaking down and falling apart, that in Jesus Christ alone we can find the peace joy, and hope that our hearts all long for because in Christ Jesus, our brokenness is made whole. Our fears are transformed into peace and the sin that once enslaved us no longer has any power over us because of Jesus' victory on our behalf at the cross. And so this morning, we're going to begin our series in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. I figured it would be appropriate to start here since it was, uh, we celebrated Easter Sunday only uh, two weeks ago. And so we're starting our series on Easter evening, that first Easter evening. 
And uh, I'm actually going to be on vacation the next two weeks, and so I'm going to be passing uh, the baton to Pastor Nick and, and Pastor Tom the next two weeks. But I'm so excited about this series because uh, it, it kind of has a, almost like a, a greatest hits flavor to it. I mean, the passages we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be looking at, at, at Moses and, and Elijah and David and uh, Peter and, and Zacchaeus and, and there's uh, and so many others. And, and so I'm so excited about these passages that we're going to, to be able to look at. But we're starting here on Easter evening where we find Jesus' disciples in dark and dire circumstances until the Lord appears before them and changes their heartache and sadness into joy and laughter. And so just to provide you with an outline of the passage we're going to study together this morning in John 20, verses 19 through 21, we're going to break it down into three parts, which are peace, joy, and mission. And so number one, peace. In verse 19, we see how Jesus' presence in the power of his resurrection brings peace into his disciples' lives. Number two, joy. In verse 20, Jesus reveals how as his followers, we can have everlasting joy even in the midst of suffering. And then lastly, number three, mission. In verse 21, the Lord communicates the mission and purpose he has given to us as his followers, which is having the privilege of sharing the saving power of God with others in both word and deed so they too can know the peace joy, hope, and everlasting love that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And and so before we, we dive in and look at our first point together, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we get to gather together as your people. And we acknowledge that you are here in our midst. And, and, and Lord, I just confess to you just, just how much noise there is in in my life and how it just can feel like everything in my life and my world is trying to pull me away from you, Lord. And so, Lord, I I pray that, that we would just set apart this time and just be still in our hearts and minds before you and just be able to listen and to and receive what it is your spirit has to say to us, that we would have our eyes fixed upon you because we, we want to grow closer to you and your unparalleled love. And so we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so our first point in our outline together is, is peace. And so it, it, we're going to start by looking at verse 19 where it says, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. The pictures that I have up on the screens are from a family trip that we took into Manhattan the last week of February 2020. And we had an incredible time, and what we did is we hit up a couple of food spots we had been wanting to go for a while. Me and my son Christopher, we're real foodies, you know? We watch like these like YouTube videos and we see these things and we're like, we check them off on our list. Like, we gotta go there. We gotta try that. And so we went into the, the city. We spent a day in the city and we went to Russ and Daughters for, for bagel locks and cream cheese. Highly recommend it. Prince Street Pizza was, was great. And then we, we finished the day at Cafe Palermo for cannolis. Really fantastic day. And so, of course, we had to walk off some of that deliciousness. And so we walked across the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges, and we enjoyed our time in in Little Italy and Chinatown. But little did we know, this would be the last family outing we'd be able to go on of any kind for the foreseeable future, as only a few weeks later, the entire world would shut down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's, it's still pretty surreal to think about, right? Like, that actually happened. Like, our entire world was turned upside down practically overnight. And, and like many of you, I found myself just absolutely glued to the news at first. And I'm not really a news person, 
But, but it was just so difficult to believe what was happening. We were trying to find answers and get information. Like we were, we were told to, to shelter in place. And, and the information we were being given or, or disinformation, depending on how you look at it, and I don't mean that to be a political statement, but just the, the sense that there was so much confusion. And this confusion had brought on fear and anxiety to the point where people felt too overwhelmed to do basic tasks like go to work or, or go to the, the, to the grocery store because of the perceived chaos that was seemingly awaiting outside our doors. And, and, and still, we still feel so many of the effects today that, that many were beset by grief and not being able to be with loved ones who were checked into the hospital and were not allowed to, we were not allowed to be with them in their last days and, and final hours. And so we still are walking in that grief. Or, or there were some people who were forced to close down their, their businesses where everything that they had built and worked for their, their entire lives was suddenly gone and we're still walking in, in that grief and those financial consequences. And then there are scores of people that developed debilitating anxiety and depression which continue to be at all time highs. But when we think about it, when we think about that, there are so many parallels that we find here that apply to what Jesus' disciples went through that first Easter night in Jerusalem. That just a week prior, everything was great. Everything was great. That they were with Jesus a week prior, that Palm Sunday, as Jesus triumphantly paraded through the streets of Jerusalem with throngs of people worshiping him and chanting his name and crying out, Hosanna, oh save us, that this was the, they, they all thought this is it. This is the promised Davidic Messiah that we had been waiting for, that he is going to restore the kingdom back to Israel. And now just one week Later, their entire world had been turned upside down. That, that you have to understand, these disciples, they had given up everything to follow Jesus. Everything. They had left everything behind to follow Jesus. And in doing so, they witnessed his incredible miracles, and, and, and they were, had a front row seat for his transformational teaching and they're like, this is it. This is it. And they had developed a close, intimate, and personal relationship with him, just loving him like a brother. And just like that, he was gone. And the reports of the empty tomb from Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John the Apostle led them to believe that the Jewish religious authorities were trying to erase Jesus' existence. You need to understand that at first, the news of the empty tomb to them was not good news. That what, what, how they received it initially was that, that the, the Jewish religious authorities, that they hated Jesus so much that crucifying him wasn't enough. That, that now they had stolen his body and they wanted to completely erase his existence. And, and so they, it started to make them think, what was next? Would they be next on their hit list? Causing, and so it caused them to shelter in place. That they had bolted the doors shut. And it's hard to imagine what their mental and emotional state must have been like after witnessing firsthand how their beloved master and friend was brutally beaten and sadistically tortured to death on the cross. Just think about that. Think about somebody that you are really close to, one of your, your best friends, somebody that, that you're so close to and that you love and that you witness that firsthand, the brutal beating and torture and the crucifixion and being crucified and put to death, that, that it happened right in front of your eyes. What would that do to you mentally and emotionally? Think about the kind of post-traumatic stress disorder that you would be suffering after that. 
You see, it's true that Mary Magdalene witnesses the risen Christ in the previous passage in John 20, verses 11 to 18, but, but because of the emotional distress that they were all going through, they kind of discounted it as like, yeah, you know, we're, we're all seeing things. You know, we're all hearing things. They just thought that it was, it was part of the, the emotional distress that they were all going through. And so disillusioned, disheartened, and, and, and despondent, the disciples, they sat together that Easter night, overwhelmed with doubt and anxiety. Like, and, and they just wondered, like, where do we go now? What are we going to do? Like, how could have we, how could we have been so wrong about Jesus? Like, we saw the miracles. We, we were there for the, 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 his incredible teaching. Like, how could we be so wrong? We, we, we just believe with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and strength that he was it, that he was the promised Messiah, that he was going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Now, what are we going to go now? We left everything to follow him. What are we going to do? Are, are, are the Jewish religious leaders, are they going to crucify us next at everything that they had saw? Is that going to happen to us now? And so they wondered, what should we do? What should our next move be? And then in an instant, everything changes. We read in the second half of verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And the text tells us that Jesus instantly appears before his disciples without entering through the, the, the locked, bolted shut door. And, and so we don't know if, if he walked through the walls. We don't know if he teleported. We don't know if he did some other miraculous work that only the author of creation, the one true God of the universe, could do in defying the laws of physics. But here's what we do know, is that Jesus does the seemingly impossible. That Jesus Christ had risen from the dead and appeared before them in his glorious resurrection body. And the message and good news that Jesus brings is this. Peace be with you. And this was the, the traditional Hebrew greeting that, that many of us are familiar with, right? Like every single culture, we have our different ways of saying hello. Like here in the New York, New Jersey area, we say, you know, how you doing? You know, we're not really asking how you doing, we're just saying hello. And so in, in first century Israel, they would say shalom, and it meant peace. However, the text makes it very clear that Jesus here is going way beyond just simply saying hello. What Jesus is saying here is actually quite profound, where that because of his victory over sin and death, the time has come where through the power of his resurrection, humanity can finally be made whole, reconciled to God, and be born again in him, that this is the new creation in Jesus Christ, that this is the peace of of God that humanity had been groaning for since sin had entered the world when Adam and Eve had to exit the garden. That that sin that created separation between us and God, that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, that he had bridged the chasm, that we can be made whole and together again with God. We read in Romans 5, verses 10 through 11, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Bible commentator and New Testament scholar Karen Jobes writes, the cognate Hebrew verb shalom means to be completed. In the biblical context, it refers to the peace of God's presence for blessing, bringing whole, abundant life to God's people. That it is only in Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection where we can know the peace of God, be made whole from the brokenness of this world, and be redeemed from our sin and being reconciled to God. And what we need to recognize is that the same peace 
and resurrection power that we see here on that first Easter night is available to each and every one of us in Christ Jesus. And one of the things that's so incredible about verse 19 is that in an instant, the entire trajectory of the disciples' lives is completely transformed. Like, everything changes in that one moment, that they go from being filled with heartache and grief and defeat and fear and anxiety and uncertainty to having what the Apostle Paul refers to in Philippians 4, 7 as the peace of God which surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, that they have the peace that only the resurrected Christ can give us. And the truth is, is that this room right here, right now, is filled with story after story and testimony after testimony of people who were at one time who were, were lost and broken and blind and seemingly hopeless in their circumstances. We actually heard five of these testimonies last week at our uh, celebration service. However, after an encounter with the risen Christ that led to trusting in him by grace through faith in him alone, we became a new creation with a new peace, joy, and purpose at the center of our lives that God has written us a new story that is written in his book of life, that this is the transformation that is only available to us in Jesus Christ. And you know, there may be some of us here this morning who feel like those disciples that first Easter night. Some of us may, may be in a place right now where we feel just stuck and hopeless and lost in our circumstances. However, what you need to know right now, here's what you need to know, and you need to hear this and you need to receive this, is, is that if that's the way you feel Right now, your feelings are betraying you. What you need to hear and receive right now is the truth, is that you are being deceived. You are being deceived. Because there is a demonic spiritual force in this world that wants you to live under oppression, that wants you to live in hopeless, hopelessness and defeat, that wants you to live where every single day you wake up in the morning and you say to yourself, what's the point? That wants you to live, that what's the point? That there's no way out, that nothing will ever change in my life. However, what Jesus wants you to know is that he overcame sin and death on your behalf and by trusting in him and receiving his resurrection power, the entire trajectory of your life can change in an instant. That this doesn't mean that our circumstances are gonna change overnight or that all the trials and difficulties in our lives are going to all of a sudden disappear because that's just not reality. However, what it does mean is that Jesus will be with you every single step of the way of what you're going through. It means that your trajectory is no longer hopeless and headed towards destruction and despair because in Jesus Christ, we have the power of his glorious resurrection available to us that can overcome anything this world can throw at us. And when we surrender our lives to Jesus, he will transform us over time into the person that he has created us to be. That we read in Deuteronomy 31.6, do, uh, do not fear or be in dread, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you, that he will not leave you or forsake you. Christian author, missionary, and Bible commentator Leslie Newbegin writes, peace is Jesus' gift to the disciples and to us. It is the peace that belongs to the new age which God has promised it is because Jesus bears the wounds of his decisive battle that he won over evil that he can offer to us peace as a gift to be received by grace through faith in him alone. That this is the good news of the gospel and resurrection of Jesus Christ which brings us everlasting peace. And so let's move ahead now to the second part in our outline this morning Joy, where in verse 20, Jesus reveals to us how we can have everlasting joy even in the midst of suffering. 
So let's go ahead and, and look at verse 20 together. It says, when Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. In verse 20, we read of how Jesus displays his scars, his wounds to his disciples. And we see that it brings them joy, that it makes them glad. You know, one of the things that men never grow out of is the enjoyment that we get from showing one another our scars, right? Like, it doesn't matter how old you are, whether it's, you know, you're working on your, your house or you're trying to fix something or maybe you're, you're a weekend warrior, you're playing a sport, and you're like, yo, check out, check out what happened. Look at this. We're, like, so proud. And as a former hockey player, there are countless times I can point back to where in the locker room, me and my teammates, we would just put on display the, the black and purple welts we would get from blocking a shot or, or the, the cuts and scars from, from getting high, high sticked. And then, of course, there are the, the occasional missing teeth. I was too smart for that. I was a goalie. I had the mask on, so I was good. I got all my teeth. But in a way... We take pride and joy in those battle scars because they point to our commitment to one another, our collective mission and our character and our identity. And on a much deeper and infinitely more significant level, this is kind of what's taking place here in verse 20. That when Jesus shows his scars from his crucifixion to his disciples, it serves a two Bold purpose. First, it's Jesus' way of revealing to them his identity. That Jesus' scars, his wounds, they show that it's him. It's the same Jesus who they followed as his disciples that they knew and loved and was crucified and put to death for their sake just a few days earlier. And secondly, and most importantly, it's Jesus' way of telling them how much he loves them. Ch check this out. Hebrews 12, verse 2. This is, this, you want to have your mind blown this morning? Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Is that not insane? Is that not crazy? Hebrews 12, 2 is just one of the most mind-blowing passages in all of the scriptures for me, that the notion that it was Jesus' joy to endure the cross and bear its shame on our behalf is something that's difficult to comprehend and to put into words. And it's not that Jesus was looking forward to the cross, right? That's not the joy that this is talking about, but it's talking about that, that, that Jesus loves us so much that the amount of joy that it brought to him in knowing that we would not have to suffer what he suffered on the cross, that going to the cross brought him joy. That's the kind of love that we have in Christ, to be loved in such a way that someone would endure such horror in our place so that we wouldn't have to in order to ensure our salvation, is absolutely, it's, it's so beautiful, it's breathtaking. It, 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 it's that unparalleled kind of love that engulfs the hearts of disciples here at verse 20, that when Jesus shows them the scars from the, the nails that were hammered into his, his hands, his wrists, and, and the, the spear, right, the wound in his side, the spear that was plunged into his side at the crucifixion that we read in verse 20, that it made the disciples glad, brought them joy when they saw the Lord. And this is the same love that leads to the everlasting joy that is available to all of us who are in Christ Jesus. You know, so often as followers of Jesus, when we hear the term joy used in the scriptures, we confuse it with the way the world uses the term joy, that it's this kind of temporary feeling of happiness that comes and goes based on whether things are going our way or not. 
This is not the kind of joy that is being referred to here. Christian joy is much different in that it's not at all temporary, and it extends beyond a feeling to a state of being. That Christian joy is the state of permanent satisfaction in our soul that is produced by the Holy Spirit after we trust in Christ for salvation. It's the ability of seeing how God is always at work in our lives, that every good thing comes from him, and that it's always his desire to bless us, right? Even when we're in the midst of suffering. That even when we're in the midst of suffering, we know that our God is always for us and never against us, and he's always looking to bless us. That we read in Romans 5, verses 3 through 5, it says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And there are many of us here this morning that we have scars. We have wounds, both physically, emotionally, mentally, even spiritually, where we endured some kind of abuse, trauma, or oppression that was the result of our sin or someone else's sin that was meant to harm us, that was meant to end in our destruction or, or to break us down. However, when we surrender our lives to Jesus, he redeems our past and transforms what was meant for evil to produce joy in us and bless others. That we read in uh, Genesis 50, verse 20, it says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That this is the story of the cross. That, that, that the evil powers, the evil demonic powers in this world and, and the Roman and, and the Jewish religious authorities, that what they meant for evil, God used for good in offering salvation to the entire world. And so God does this same exact thing in each of our lives. Because when we trust in Jesus Christ, his story becomes our story. That Jesus' scars remind us that the powers of evil, sin, and death, that they tried to end Jesus' life, and they failed. And when, we're, when we trust in Jesus Christ, the same is true for us. That when we trust in Jesus Christ, we become one with him, where his victory becomes our victory, and his scars become our scars. That they are the scars that point to our salvation and tell the story of God's amazing grace and perfect love that leads to our everlasting joy. That we read in 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And so this leads us to the third and, and final point in our study this morning, mission. Where in verse 21, Jesus communicates the mission and purpose that he has given to us as his followers, which is the privilege of being able to share the saving power of God in both word and deed with others so they too can know the peace, joy, hope, and everlasting love that can only be found in Jesus Christ. And so let's go ahead and read the conclusion of our passage in verse 21. It says, Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so... I am sending you. You know, one of the things that is so incredible about this passage and very, very, very easy for us to overlook is that since the last time the disciples were all gathered together with Jesus, which was most likely in this same room, right, at the, at the, for the Last Supper, at the Passover, that they had all failed Jesus miserably. Like, think about it. When Jesus asked Peter, James, and John to watch with him as he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane bef uh, uh, before he's uh, uh, arrested, what do they do? They fall asleep on him. Peter denies Jesus three times during the events of the crucifixion. 
And we read in Mark 14, 50, that after Jesus' betrayal and arrest, they all left him and fled. Yet, as Jesus appears before them, right, there, there had to be, been like a second here for the disciples to be like, what is he going to say? Like, hasn't been really great since the last time we saw him. But as Jesus appears before them, there's not an ounce of condemnation, is there? There's no getting even or, or settling the score, you know, letting them know how they failed him, right? There's no guilt, there's no shame, but rather there's only grace and mercy and forgiveness, which leads to peace, joy, and their transformation. That Christian author and theologian, A.W. Pink, he writes, well, Jesus might have said, shame upon you, but instead he says, peace be unto you. He would remove from their hearts all fear which his sudden and unannounced appearance might have occasioned. Having put away their sins, he could now remove their fears. If we want to experience the peace, joy, and being made whole that comes with having reconciliation with God, then the place we need to start is with the grace and forgiveness that we find at the center of our faith that is modeled by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't mean forsaking justice or making ourselves vulnerable to abuse, but when we harbor a grudge or anger against someone who's wronged us, we, we, we hold on to something, we're unknowingly allowing that unforgiveness to fester into bitterness where it wraps its tentacles around our hearts and it takes control of us. Nelson Mandela has attributed the saying, bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. We read in Romans 2, verses 3 and 4, do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. In other words, how can we not forgive others after the way Jesus has forgiven us and that it was our sin that nailed him to the cross? And what does Jesus show us? Kindness and forgiveness, which led to our repentance. And so we all need to ask ourselves, who is it that we need to forgive this morning? Could be a friend, a family member, your parents, your spouse, your coworker, your boss, whoever. It might be that you need to forgive yourself for a sin that you've committed in your past. Well, whatever the case may be, the only way we can be free of the perpetual downward spiral and cycle of sin and brokenness and revenge is through forgiving one another. That when we both receive and show one another grace, mercy, and the kindness of God that leads to repentance, it has the power to transform families and marriages and communities and entire nations. However, this forgiveness and reconciliation can only be found in Jesus Christ who satisfied the wrath of God and won justice on our behalf by being our perfect sacrifice and atonement at the cross where through his victory over sin and death, he offers us the forgiveness of sins by trusting in him by grace through faith in him alone. And so it is in, it is in this spirit of, of grace and love and forgiveness and reconciliation that Jesus says to us in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, even so... I am sending you. That Jesus now sends us out into the world as his people, equipped and dwelt with his Holy Spirit and the very power of God, which is found in the message of his glorious gospel. That in the same way Jesus has forgiven us and restored our brokenness and given us peace and joy in his name, we now have the privilege of being able to offer it to others. However, just like Jesus, we must be willing to leave our comfortable 
surroundings. And that Jesus left heaven and pursued us while we were still sinners. That we must be willing to step into the brokenness and breakdowns of other people's lives in the same way he did that with us and taking on flesh. Jesus spent all of his, his time right with, with prostitutes. He was in the bars. He was with the drunk. He was with everybody, the gent- everybody who said that, that, the, that the, the Jewish religious leaders said that were unclean. But Jesus was willing to, to get his hands dirty. And are we willing to get our hands dirty like Jesus did time and again? To love people with the grace and mercy that can only be found in the gospel of Jesus Christ where the unparalleled kindness of God leads us to repentance and transformation. That we read in 1 Thessalonians 2.8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves because you had become very dear to us. And so as the Father sent Jesus, our Lord and Savior now sends us as the sent people of God on mission to bring the good news of peace, joy, and reconciliation to a broken and lost world. And so are we willing to step into our community, indwelt with the Holy Spirit, clothed in the full armor of God, and armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ to share with others how Jesus has saved us from sin and death so they can experience his transformational power in their lives as well? Are we willing to to equip ourselves for this mission that God has called us to, grounding ourselves in the truth of Scripture, prayer, and Christian community? Are we willing to love others the way Jesus has loved us, not treating people like projects, but loving one another like family, stepping into one another's brokenness with with grace and mercy and patience and long-suffering, always being quick to forgive and never being easily offended, cultivating relationships grounded in in trust and vulnerability and and Christian intimacy. See, if it's the desire of our hearts, see, our our friends, our family members, our neighbors, and our, our community all be made whole, then we must look to our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the only way, the truth, and the life, the one who poured himself out unto death so that we could be raised to life. And so this is the mission that the Lord Jesus has graciously called us to and invited us to, the privilege that is God working in and through us, brittle jars of clay like us, to take what has been broken and make it whole again, made new and born again in Christ Jesus. I'd like to call the worship team to come up. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your son Jesus and the glorious power of his resurrection in the way you loved us and you showed us the way to peace and joy and wholeness, that you pursued us while we were still sinners, that you took on flesh and you stepped into our brokenness and that you made the sacrifice of ultimate price defeating sin and death through the power of your resurrection so that we could be made whole, so that we could be made new. Lord Jesus, thank you for stepping into my brokenness, into my breakdowns, into my sin. And I pray for anybody here this morning who who is yet to look to you, anybody here this morning who is is struggling right now, who just feels broken and and hopeless and lost, Lord, that they would be able to see that there is hope, that there is healing, and it is in you and you alone that they would take that step this morning and trust in you and look to you in faith that day after day they would look to you and trust in you And that they would see that the entire trajectory of their life will change. So they would know the peace and the joy and the love that only you can provide. And I pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.